Tonight, rolling the dice on expanding gambling in Texas. Texas is poised to be the largest sports betting market in the country if we were to pass it. State lawmakers make the case for sports betting and legalizing casinos, but some are concerned how it could hurt Texans. Plus, is TikTok out of time? The app's CEO hopes to dodge a possible ban amid a standoff with U.S. lawmakers, and one of his solutions is called Operation Texas. And later, a decades-long secret revealed. How a former Texas politician says he unknowingly helped sabotage Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign and why he's finally coming clean. Capital Tonight starts right now. Thanks for joining us here on Capital Tonight. I'm Karina Kling. Texas lawmakers are pushing hard this session to expand gambling in the state. A House panel heard hours of testimony this week over efforts to legalize casino gambling and permit sports betting. The lawmaker spearheading the sports betting bill argues it's already rampant in Texas and regulating it would help protect consumers. We can, I believe, with this carefully crafted bill, set up a framework um, and parameters that promote transparency, um, that provide appropriate protections and accountability. Supporters also stress it would provide thousands of jobs and bring in millions in state revenue, but not everyone is convinced. Our Charlotte Scott reports on why some Texans are worried that gambling addiction will rise in Texas if mobile sports betting is legalized. When Saul Malik was a sophomore at Trinity University in San Antonio, an acquaintance messaged him about joining a sports book. And I won that first bet. And even though it was like 10 bucks, I felt like I was at the top of the world, higher than I'd ever been before. Replicating that feeling turned into a gambling addiction. He lost $20,000 and is still paying it off. He went to his first recovery meeting in 2018, but didn't take it seriously until a mentor talked to him about getting clean. It really sort of opened my eyes to the level of desperation I was in and feeling, you know, suicidal and really had no hope. And um, I decided to just, you know, had to try something else. He stopped gambling in 2019. Now he's studying clinical mental health counseling at Southern Methodist University, and he wants to help gambling addicts. A 2021 study by a gambling recovery organization reveals that an estimated 2.2% of Texas adults are believed to manifest a gambling problem. That's more than 485,000 people. This is where it's more important than ever to promote safer gambling practices. Devin Mills, the president of the Texas Coalition on Problem Gambling says Texas lacks resources for gambling addicts. Plano area representative Jeff Leach's bill to legalize sports betting for adults over 21 tries to address that. It says 2% of the tax revenue generated by gambling would go to research and gambling addiction treatment. If mobile sports betting is legalized, estimates show Texas will generate nearly $70 million in year one alone. And the Sports Betting Alliance says legalization will make gambling safer than it is right now. And when you use those illegal offshore apps, you're not going to get the help that you need. You're not going to get that messaging encouraging you to bet responsibly. But if we legalize it and have a legal mobile sports betting market, we will be able to step in and help folks that might need it. Malik isn't worried about relapsing, but he is concerned about other young adults who might start placing bets if the bill passes. I mean, it's all designed to further an addictive process in someone's mind. So it, it's scary. It is scary that a lot of kids, I think, will be participating in it. For Capital Tonight, I'm Charlotte Scott. And for more on where Texans stand on this issue, let's bring in Jim Henson. He's the director of the Texas Politics Project at the University of Texas at Austin. Good to see you. Great to be back. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, you recently did polling on gambling. Where do Texans overall stand on this issue? And I know we've got a graphic of one of your yeah, they're very point. divided. I mean, there's no consensus on gambling. As the graphic shows, on one hand, when we ask Texans, do you think gambling laws should be more strict, less strict, left alone, basically, a plurality says they should be less strict, 39%. Good news for gambling advocates. Sure. But that's not a groundswell, and it's not quite critical mass in public opinion, which has been one of the obstacles that gambling advocates have, have faced. Yeah, and I'm seeing that again this legislative session. I know you also broke this down by party. Can you kind of walk us through? I mean, we've got Republicans yeah. who are pushing these bills, but I know that there have been Democrats that have done this as well, and maybe some of them this session as well. Yeah, traditionally the pattern has been that Democrats are more open to expanded gaming than Republicans. 
That gap has closed a little bit over time. Democrats are still more supportive than Republicans. I think the issue that you have here is which Republicans are supportive and which Republicans are not. Yeah. And most conser the most conservative Republicans are those who are most steadfastly opposed. These are Republicans who are primary voters. Yeah, I mean, let's bring that up. We've got the one on the conservatives, and just in terms of where people stand. I know we just showed. Right. Yeah, there. So have... those, you know, the darker bars in the graphic are the most conservative from left to right, and so where you really see the most conservative Texans gathered on that graphic are the folks that want to just leave the laws alone mm -hmm. or a, a somewhat smaller share that want to make laws more strict but together the status quo and the more strict are about two-thirds uh, or about 60 percent of the most conservative Republicans these are a very powerful constituency inside the Republican Party. How much has this really changed over the years? Because this is not the first session that they've been yeah. trying to expand gambling. You know, it's not changed a lot. Um, we've seen a little bit of movement. Like I said, I think, I think we've seen a little bit of movement among Republicans becoming yeah. a, li a bit more supportive. Um, but the hardcore of more conservative Republicans are still a problem for the, the advocates of this. This is why they're having a problem in the Senate. Yeah, and I know we've heard from the Lieutenant Governor, um, who has consistently been kind of against this and pushing these forward. Uh, what do you think this ultimately means then for um, these bills passing? I mean, obviously this would be something that would be a change to the Constitution, so it requires, ultimately right. requires voter approval. I mean, do you see any traction on this? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think as your report illustrated, we're seeing a, a little bit of traction in the House. And I think yeah. that on the plus side, the the interests that are interested in, in expanding gambling have really solved one of their big internal problems. And even and Chairman Guerin, when he laid out his bill, said this in the legislature. That is, there are a lot of competing gambling interests and a lot of things that have hurt these bills legislatively in the past have been one or the other faction within the broader industry feeling cut out and not supporting legislation. These big omnibus bills that yeah. we're seeing this time seem to help solve that problem, but it's not solved the problem in the Senate. Yeah. So I so I think I I think it's still it's still I would bet against it. Yeah, good. Good good pun there. And we'll see kind of can continue to roll the dice on this issue. <laughs> we can see go where on things like yeah, we could. We've done it before, I think, Jim. So Jim Benson, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Great to be back, Rena. Thank you. The debate over drag shows in Texas is intensifying. The Senate committee is still hearing testimony right now over a bill that would ban minors from drag performances in the state. Business owners could face a $10,000 fine for hosting a drag show in front of children, and performers could be criminally charged. Supporters of the bill say it's to protect children from sexually explicit entertainment, but opponents say it's just another attack on the LGBTQ community. You may think that this is something that won't actually harm anybody, um, will be an inconvenience perhaps to drag performers and businesses, but I promise you, legislation like this encourages people to act more violently towards our community, and it needs to stop. Vote against this bill. Another bill which would remove public funding from libraries that host drag reading events was also heard today. Former President Donald Trump is coming to Texas on Saturday. He'll hold his first rally of his 2024 presidential campaign in Waco as a possible indictment and primary challenges loom. The Texas Politics Project at UT Austin, who you just heard from, also recently surveyed Texans on Trump and found a majority of Republicans think Trump should run for president again. But most independent voters say Trump should avoid another shot at the White House. The polling and his visit to Texas come as the Manhattan grand jury investigating Trump's reported hush money payments to an adult film star is on hold until next week. They are expected to meet again Monday, but no word on when they will vote. Turning now to Capitol Hill, the CEO of TikTok faced Congress for the first time as a growing number of lawmakers are raising concerns about the app's data policies and its ties to China. Taylor Poplar's reports on how one of the CEO's possible solutions involves Texas. More than 150 million Americans use TikTok, but several members of Congress made clear Thursday they think the app should be banned. TikTok surveils us all, and the Chinese Communist Party is able to use this as a tool 
to manipulate America as a whole. I'm not convinced that the benefits outweigh the risks. TikTok CEO Sho Chu promised the House Energy and Commerce Committee that he will ensure Americans' data remains secure. We have to earn their trust with decisions we make for our company and our products. There is widespread suspicion in Congress that TikTok's parent company, Beijing-based ByteDance, is beholden to the Chinese government and has higher-ups willing to do its bidding. That concern part of a growing mistrust in Washington about China's business practices and government. Chu said TikTok is not owned or controlled by the Chinese government and that he's working to have Americans' TikTok data stored on U.S. soil and overseen by the Texas-based tech company Oracle. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Chu previewed his testimony on TikTok earlier this week, encouraging the app's fans to reach out to lawmakers or even come to Capitol Hill. <laughs> Some users did just that, small business owners and teachers who touted the app's importance. I got a chance to stop by, leave my name in the guest book. TikTok allows me to break down those classroom walls and educate millions of people around the world. But most lawmakers at the hearing remain skeptical. One introduced parents of a child who died by suicide after being exposed to self-harm content on TikTok. Your company destroyed their lives. Others quiz Chu on whether TikTok censors certain material. The massacre in Tiananmen Square. That kind of content is available on our platform. You can go and search it. I will remind you that making false or misleading statements to Congress is a federal crime. Some lawmakers showed support for TikTok on Wednesday, saying the app offers a platform to often marginalize people. They warned against unfairly pushing anti-China rhetoric. It poses about the same threat that companies like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Twitter polls. Some lawmakers want TikTok banned in the U.S. Others want the government to investigate the company and consider restrictions while also tightening data privacy laws. The Biden administration has said it wants TikTok to be sold to a U.S.-based company or potentially face a ban. In Washington, Taylor Popolars, Capital Tonight. Still to come on Capital Tonight, the price of so-called school choice, how much a voucher-like program could end up costing the state. Plus, spilling a 40-year-old secret, a former prominent Texas lawmaker reveals his role in thwarting Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign. Welcome back. Let's take a look now at some of the other political stories making headlines today. A Texas House panel approved a new state budget that includes property tax cuts, border security initiatives, and pay raises for state employees and teachers. But some critics point to what's not included, like funding for rent relief and child care programs. The bill now heads to the full House for consideration. The Senate is working on its own plan, and the two chambers will ultimately have to hammer out their differences. A school voucher-like program in Texas could cost $1 billion within three years. That's according to a newly released fiscal note from the state's Legislative Budget Board. The board looked at the Senate's priority plan that would give families wanting to switch to private schools $8,000 in public funds to spend on tuition or other costs. The analysis also notes public schools would lose money but does not give a specific number. State lawmakers are pushing for Texas teachers to be trained to administer life-saving overdose drugs to students. It's an attempt to address the fentanyl crisis hitting schools. Eight bills calling for some sort of opioid emergency training for school personnel have been filed by Democrats. Now to a story that's been kept a secret for four decades. A prominent Texas politician says he unwittingly took part in a 1980 tour of the Middle East that he later realized was to sabotage the re-election campaign of President Jimmy Carter. Former Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes told the New York Times that the person he served beside, Governor John Connolly, encouraged Iran militants to hold 52 American hostages until after Election Day. According to Barnes, Connolly was angling to impress Republican nominee Ronald Reagan in hopes he'd be named Secretary of State or Defense. The hostage crisis in Iran paralyzed Carter's presidency, and freeing the Americans was his best chance for winning a second term. But Barnes said during their trip, Connolly told Arab leaders to hold off because Reagan would win and give them a better deal. 
And with us now to discuss this fascinating story further is Todd Gilman. He's the Washington bureau chief for the Dallas Morning News and spoke with some of the hostages since this story was released. Todd, good to see you. Thanks for being back on with us. Um, first off, I know that you haven't spoken with uh, Ben Barnes personally, but why did he keep the secret for so long just in the reporting that you've done and that you've read? And why did he feel the need to share this huge secret now? Well, the second question is a lot easier. Uh, Jimmy Carter is 98. He recently went into hospice care. He's not going to be around very much longer. And Ben Barnes told the New York Times that uh, knowing that the end was near for Carter, he just felt uh, a need to clear his conscience and unburden himself. Uh, why Barnes sat on this secret for so many years other than um, trying to uh, avoid being implicated in something that is absolutely scandalous um, and despicable in the view of many people. Uh, he also was a Democrat, although Connolly had been a Democrat and had become a Republican. Barnes himself remained a Democrat, and he told The New York Times he didn't want to be seen as having betrayed a Democratic president and his party and helped cost his party the White House. Yeah, um, having spoken with some of the hostages, I mean, how are they responding to this revelation? Well, rumors were actually circulating at the embassy in Tehran during their captivity that something surely must be going on domestically back home in, in Washington uh, on, on the U.S. political scene to have kept the captivity going on for so long. They, they felt that something was wrong. Um, and even well after the release, there were a lot of suspicions that there had been back channeling of some sort or some kind of political sabotage that had prolonged the captivity. Uh, so really the, the hostages, former hostages who I spoke with weren't stunned uh, to find out that there was actually a witness, that there was finally evidence and testimony to support uh, a suspicion that they and many, many others had had for years. Todd, what do you think this will mean for Carter's legacy? Do you think it'll change anything? At the time, it was obvious to everyone, to Carter, to Reagan, uh, that the hostage crisis was a, a huge anvil on the Carter presidency. Uh, so it now allows historians to look back and say he got an even more raw deal than we thought he got, uh, that that crisis could have ended before election day and that election could have turned out differently. Now that said, you know, Reagan won. Uh, he ended the Cold War. He did a lot of other things that a lot of other people admire. Uh, history is what it is yeah. and there's no telling what would have happened. Well, lastly, we just have about 30 seconds left. What about Connolly's legacy in, in the midst of all of this? And, and you mentioning Reagan, I mean, is there any knowledge of Reagan's involvement? So Reagan is dead, Connolly's dead. Um, William Casey, who was uh, Reagan's campaign chairman and later CIA director, is dead. Um, he, according to Barnes, was aware of this mission that Connolly undertook. There's no evidence and no way to know whether Reagan himself knew about it. This certainly tarnishes John Connolly's legacy. There's, uh, there's just no, there's no way to, to whitewash it that Connolly went to the Middle East talked to Anwar Sadat and other Arab leaders, tried to get messages to Iran, uh, Iranian leaders yeah. to prolong the hostage uh, captivity. There's, uh, it doesn't look good on his posthumous resume. Yeah, just a, a stunning revelation that I know you'll continue to look into. Todd Gilman of the Dallas Morning News, thank you so much for your time. Sure thing. And still to come on Capitol tonight, the fight against fentanyl hits home for one Texas mom. How she's shining a light on opioid overdoses in children. Welcome back to Capitol tonight. As we mentioned earlier, lawmakers this legislative session are prioritizing fighting the fentanyl crisis in Texas, especially overdoses among minors. And one mother in South Texas is shining a light on fentanyl poisoning after the death of her daughter. Brian Bose has more. This is her room. 
The trip into her daughter's bedroom is never easy. Everything's the same as she left it. This is where I found her, laying on the bed. But Veronica Caprosi wants you to remember this. I went to go touch her, and her skin was cold, hard, white, and purple. To remember her pain. You think she's going to walk in our front door, our garage door? But no, she's gone. To remember her daughter, Danica, and how one mistake took her life last July. One of her last text messages on her phone was telling her friend that she was going to take the last Percocet. But it wasn't Percocet. It was fentanyl. Danica's on here. She's 17. The Caprosi's child was gone. All these Not things. because of a drug overdose or addiction, but because of a terrifying reality. There's more. This is just the handful. One they share with so many others. They lost their son, Spencer. This is Ginger. She lost her daughter, Brooke. These families still grieve, but they're not letting it stop them from fighting back. There's my baby. There she is. A billboard featuring Danica stands in Selma, Texas, just outside San Antonio. It's one of many across the state put up by families who've lost someone to fentanyl poisoning. But Veronica didn't stop there. Explain the dangers of fentanyl poisoning. She recently teamed with State Representative John Lujan and the San Antonio Firefighters Union to make this PSA. Danica was the light of our life. It's intent to let you know this. It could hit any family. Rich, poor, white, black, blue, purple. Fentanyl poisoning doesn't discriminate. And maybe more importantly, to help another family Avoid the same trip they make every day. I'm a and that was Brian Bowes reporting. That is all the time that we have tonight. We're back again tomorrow with the latest in Texas politics. Until then, thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a great night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. And for more refreshing stories about your community, click the subscribe button right over here. You can also download our Spectrum News app to get live news coverage, weather alerts, and more wherever you are. And don't forget to tune in to Channel 55 on DISH and DirecTV for live local reporting every single day. We'll see you then.